On today's episode of Locked On Mariners, Mariners broadcaster Gary Hill Jr. joins us to talk some ball. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Thursday, February 16th, 2023. This is Tidy Gonzalez for the Locked On Mariners podcast. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe, like, and turn on alerts if you're watching on YouTube. Or subscribe and leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform if you like what you hear. And if you want to hear from us even more, please consider signing up for our Patreon. The link as well as our social accounts is in the description below. On the show today, we're talking with Mariners broadcaster Gary Hill Jr. We both reflected on the Mariners' epic comeback in Toronto and also talked about Seattle's offseason and a whole lot more. Before we get into that, though, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a comment below this video to increase your odds of winning a signed Walter Ford card from Colby's collection. The winner will be picked on Monday. Now, without further ado, here's Gary Hill Jr. We have a returning guest joining us today on Locked on M's, Mariners broadcaster and host of the Mariners pod, Gary Hill Jr. Gary, always a pleasure to chat with you. First, great to uh, see you once again. Yeah, great to see you. How, how was your offseason? What, what did you get into this winter? Oh, it's good. Uh, off season is a lot of time with the family. Uh, once first pitch of spring training gets thrown, it's pretty all encompassing. <laughs> once the season starts, I mean, it's every day, even off days, really on our off days. So the off season is the time just spend as much time with the family as possible, relax, taking some hoops, you know, nice. Try and recharge more than anything. So my wife watches pretty much every episode that we do here on Locked on M's. And still to this day, she says that her favorite episode that we've done is the one that you and I did uh, oh. the day before the, uh, the, the drought ender. And mm. so this whole off season, she's been hounding me. When is Gary coming back on the show? You got to get Gary back on the show. You got to message Gary. Well, Caroline, I messaged Gary. Gary's back on the show. He's here in the flesh. So we're going to talk some M's. Uh, Gary I'm feeling pressure now, just so you know. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, you, you gotta live up to these expectations. I know. <laughs> so the last time you and I chatted, like really chatted was about an hour or so before first pitch at mm -hmm. game two of the wildcard series in Toronto. Uh, you came down to the 500 level concourse, talked to my buddy Keith and I for a few minutes, uh, just about, you know, the game the night before and what we were hoping to see out of Robbie. And obviously, you know, things didn't really go according to plan. Uh, it Really nothing went according to plan in that game. Um, you know, and I think you and I really couldn't have possibly wrapped our heads around what we were about to experience that night. And, you know, we haven't really talked since then. So I want to start here. Like, what was that whole experience like for you? And, and you know, what was the what was the celebration like? Because I had a great time afterwards. <laughs> uh, yeah it's hard to put into words. It was really indescribable uh, mm -hmm. the way everything unfolded. And I think you hit it perfectly. There was no way to know when we talked just hours later, what we had in store for us, because that game was incredible. It was an all timer. There there's just the ups and downs, the roller coaster ride uh, was amazing. And the way it, you know, it's so funny because I, I thought about it as the game was kind of progressing and, the thing that always sticks in my mind is when Romano came in late mm. in the game. And I'm like, this is great because for tomorrow, he's not going to be able to throw as many pitches as, you know what I mean? That's where my mm. mind was as the game's going on. Even at that point, I wasn't thinking, hey, they're going to come back and get this thing. That's where my mind was. I was already playing it forward to the next day. And yeah. What do you know? They make it happen. The celebration was incredible. The Mariner fans that stayed all gathered behind the dugout, and the celebration was on. It felt like uh, after the clinch game where people just stuck around forever. Mm -hmm. uh, the players were uh, – the celebration between the players and, the, and Scott and the coaching staff, and just after all this time, you know, clinching and getting to the postseason was obviously significant but then to win a postseason series against a really good team the blue jays really good and they were playing mm. really well at the time and to me a really scary team and to do it at their place was incredible it's it's still hard for me <laughs> to put into words yeah. especially being there and experiencing it but it was awesome it was insane like definitely yeah. the 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 craziest sports moment of my life uh 
definitely the craziest game that I've been to in person. I was at the James Paxson no hitter, um, mm. and uh, that just topped it uh, tenfold. It was crazy. Um, you know, I tried to get down there with the the rest of the fans, and they had the they had the ramps from the 500 level to the to uh, down below blocked off, so I I couldn't get down there. Yeah. I could only exit. So. Uh, but, you know, from the top, I saw everyone celebrating. I saw, you know, Julio walking off and everyone chanting the MVP and all this stuff. And that game was just nuts thinking about how that thing started. I mean, like you, you know, you were thinking about the next day and what was going to happen the next day. And I mean, all the fans around me, I could see them like buying tickets for <laughs> Sunday, you know, and I'm thinking like, I don't know if I can do this again, like going tomorrow. Like I'm already a nervous wreck as is like, I don't know if I could do it in an elimination game. Like maybe I'll just stay home. I don't know. Like, you know, and then like the chance the Robbie, Robbie, uh, I was in hell. I was in hell that whole game. Um, can, was, I show was, you, uh, can I step off camera for a second? And, yeah, and go for it. Show you a souvenir that I brought from the clubhouse after the game from Toronto. Yes. I think yeah, you'll like it. It's worth it. Do it. Just, just do give it. me a second. Yeah, sure. Sure. So we stayed on the air for mm -hmm. ever after the game. And we had one of those, those post games that went forever. But then I went into the clubhouse after and you no. Know, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing I think it was fabulous. The, the Blue Jays logo on it mm -hmm. is so this. This is a keeper. This is an all timer. Yeah, so you, you have to have that one. I I yeah. have uh, a couple of the towels. Uh, actually, I think they're upstairs. But uh, I have a couple of the the rally towels from from that series and everything. It's uh, nice. Yeah, I'm never going to forget that day at all. Like, no. and even the day before too. Like the the Luis Castillo performance. Just the whole experience of those two days was mind -bl like i still like kind of i kind of have to pinch myself because it just it still doesn't feel real to this day it's it was just wild you know it's funny too and i talk to people about this all the time it, it is something too about watching your team in enemy mm. territory and an opposing building especially with everything on the line like that it's an mm. experience that i hope everyone gets to experience at some point because it's yeah. really unique to mm. be just surrounded by the wildness and everyone going nuts for the opposition. And there you are kind of on an Island and there are other Mariner fans you can see obviously, but, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's like you against the world. It feels like, and to watch Castillo deal in that circumstance and just shove, I got to say he watching him pitch is one of the big joys of my life at this point. He yeah. is unbelievable. It's the whole real? thing. It's, it's the stuff, it's the flair that he does it with, the joy that he's pitching with on the mound, the smile, the I mean, the, yeah, every yeah. the whole package. I I love it, and that it's, it's that Toronto amazing, game man. was perfect. Yeah, it's amazing, man. You know, especially Colby and I were talking about this on yesterday's show you know, with the Frankie Montes injury and thinking mm -hmm. about how easily that could be the Mariners, mm -hmm. the Mariners could be the Yankees in the situation, and the Yankees could have Luis Castillo, and just how. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much does that set the Mariners back if they ended up trading Edwin Arroyo and Noel V. Marte, et cetera, for Frankie Montes instead of Castillo? Just like that decision as a whole might have changed the the course of the Mariners for the next five, ten years, really. Like when you when you really think about it, I, I, I even just going back to when we were talking about it yesterday, I feel like I understated just how crucial that whole scenario is to to this team right now so that's that's just it's it's crazy to think about castillo is amazing uh watching him just dominate just absolutely shove uh in in front of all those fans was wild uh just one of the coolest moments ever i got i gotta tell you though the the most conflicting moment of that whole weekend for me was when uh jp tied it on the bloop uh, single and you know, Springer and Bichette are down on the ground and I'm in enemy territory and on the inside, I'm freaking out because, oh my God, we just tied the game. But also I'm like, I can't cheer <laughs> right now. Oh. I cannot. I, I literally can. I'm like looking around like at people next to me. I'm like, yeah, man, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, that was actually uh, really hard to watch. Yeah. What happened to Springer. And it's funny because I was asked, the top five moments from this past Mariner season recently. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of, when you really start to think about it, there's a ton of great moments. And I just, I couldn't put that one in there mm -hmm. given it's obviously 
hugely significant to the Mariners season in that game, but just that side of it, the Springer side yeah. of it, I just can't do it because of that. It's just, I, I give him all the credit in the world and all those, the entire, I mean, everyone was going after that ball like the game was on the line because the mm -hmm. game was on the line. And yeah. unfortunately it was just hit. And, you know, fortunately for the Mariners, it's hit in the right spot. Unfortunately for those guys, it was just, it was brutal. brutal. I mean, I give him credit for, I mean, talk about going all out. They did, and yeah. they paid the price, unfortunately. Brutal. Uh, absolutely brutal. But, you know, it, just looking back on that series, I think that builds just, uh, you know, even more to what this – I mean, because it's always been kind of a rivalry, right? Especially with the Blue Jays fans invading Timo, and, you know, over the years. And uh, just the fact that these two teams have been very much in line, and, you know, in wild card positioning for not mm -hmm. just this past year but the last couple of years as well. I, I think that's just kind of one of the great, like – underrated rivalries that we have going on right now in baseball i'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out this year and you know seeing that stadium now like ever since like you know i've walked by there a few times and i just i get chills man thinking about that that weekend yeah aaron goldsmith and i talk about it all the time when that place is full there are it is right there with mm. best atmospheres in all of baseball it is incredible that place gets so loud and i thought Kind of a a big factor in that series was how the Mariners were able to keep them quiet, quiet-ish mm -hmm. for large portions of those two games, uh, just because, of, especially the first game with way Castillo pitched. But that atmosphere is unbelievable. That's, mm -hmm. that's what you want, right? That's yeah. exactly what you want. And you're right about the rivalry. And I think uh, Tyoscar on the Mariners side now spices things up a little bit too when you can look at uh, the Mariners and Blue Jays. So again, you kind of forecast what this thing could look like and the way things play out this season, we could see another yeah. tussle between these two teams again, So, which would be pretty great. More from my conversation with Gary Hill Jr. in just a moment, but first, a reminder, this episode of Locked On Mariners is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, which is America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything, like the Timberwolves at minus three against the Wizards tonight. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay so don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on that's fanduel.com slash l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n to learn more make every moment more with fanduel an official sports betting partner of the nba you're listening to the locked on mariners podcast thank you again for making us your first listen let's get right back into my conversation with gary hill jr so you mentioned him tay oscar's here now he's ours He's no longer cranking dingers off of Robbie Ray in the wild card series, which is great. Uh, he was literally the reason for all the Robbie chants. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you add Colton Wong as well. Obviously, you, you lose guys like Mitch and, and Carlos Santana and Adam Frazier and Eric Swanson. But, you know, you also take a couple of interesting flyers on AJ Pollock and Tommy LaStella, et cetera. So, you know, what do you think about this offseason as a whole for the Mariners? I mean, it's been a pretty divisive offseason on social right. media for, for the fan base, but what do you think about it? Yeah, and I understand it. Uh, I understand where that comes from. I, I will say I, I don't think there's any question the Mariners are better. I think, Agreed. you know, clearly they needed more at second base, and I I love Colton, Colton Long. I think he's a really good player. I think – He's an upgrade offensively, and I'm really curious to see uh, him defensively this year, especially with the new rules. Uh, as we all know, second base is going to be critical defensively, even more so than it's been the past few seasons. So I'm interested to see how that plays out. I love Teoscar Hernandez. Uh, so do I, man. My so offensive I. bias, I love guys that hit the ball hard. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that if you were to put uh, – if I were to summarize hitting – I think you're trying to hit the ball as hard as you can, as often as you can. That's how I would just simply put it. And Teoscar Hernandez hits the ball really hard. Uh, it's funny. We had a conversation before the Blue Jays series talking about just the matchups and how things line up. And Vladdy Bichette, those are the the obvious guys in their lineup that that's scary. But we talked about Teoscar as a guy that, you don't want to face with a couple guys aboard because he's scary with that really power. Scary. He changed the game with one swing. And we saw it play out. It just so happens the Mariners came back and overcame it. But we saw what he's about. 
-hmm. I think he's a legit middle of the order thumper and a game changer for this team. And I love him and Julio, that dynamic, both on the field and off the field, I think is going to be super fun. Uh, Task is a really fun guy. I think he's, he's just going to be a, so much fun to watch. And I love the bat in the middle of the lineup. Uh, Paula too, I think is super interesting because he still crushes lefties and you look at the platoon situation and I think all our eyes are on Kelnick. I think that's a story that we'll all be watching early in the season, especially with the Trammell news uh, yeah. that just came out, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But uh, you know, cause you look at kind of how the offense shapes up and you kind of look at projections and where could they get the most gains, you know, Kelnick's kind of the, the guy you're looking at right that that's kind of the biggest unknown when it comes to the offense this season what is that platoon going to look like in left field what will Kelnick and Pollock bring to the table offensively in left field I'm optimistic I'm still a Kelnick believer I mean he's super mm -hmm. young <laughs> I think yeah. that gets overlooked a lot yeah. uh and I don't think he'll have as much pressure on him coming into the season because I felt like at times like when he first came up it was almost like here's the savior has arrived kind of thing. I don't think he has that kind of pressure to mm -hmm. be a pillar offensively because they have, I think they're just solid up and down, but I yeah. think health is going to be a big key and there's no way around that. Yeah. Yeah. Health is going to be a big key, but it's a big key for everything. Right? Everybody. You can, yeah, I know. You can say that for everyone. Yeah. 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 You know, so the thing with Kelnick too, and you know, we had Jerry on here a couple of weeks ago and he was telling us, heard, just, you know, from Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was a pretty cool opportunity for us. Jerry's Jerry's fantastic. Um, yeah. just a wonderful guy, uh, really way more generous with his time than he needed to be. It was, it was great. Uh, he, um, but you know, he, he, he talked to us about Kelnick and just, you know, in Tremel before, you know, he had the context of the, the injury, of course, about, you know, just how important it would be for this organization. If one of those guys actually hits mm -hmm. and you know, you get it right. Like, Obviously, now you're in a in a space uh, where you can't wait too long on these guys. You have very high aspirations for yourself this year, but you know you kind of want to see. Like you don't want to block them outright because if one of them actually breaks out here, you have a controllable outfielder for the next six years who can produce at you know uh, if you're you know trying to assume here with someone like Kelnick I mean essentially a fringe all-star level at, at the very least and so that changes the whole dynamic of the Mariners as a whole from a roster uh, perspective and then it puts less pressure on you to go out and maybe target one of you know like the Brian Reynolds of the world mm -hmm. and so yeah you know so I'm I'm really really interested to see Kelnick uh this year and, and you know if he comes in a little more you know trim uh you know to help him develop more of a fluid swing so he can catch up to those you know fastballs in the middle top portion of the zone and I think that would be huge for him uh, I think that would really change the makeup of his game and, and hopefully lead to finally some success for him and, and like you mentioned too you know the importance of taking that pressure off of him now he does yeah. there is no pressure on him it's just you know you, you either contribute or you don't and we're going to move on if you don't and that's that's what it is so. you hit on yeah and you hit on i think one of the more interesting questions with where the mariners are at right now and it's a question mm -hmm. i've asked justin and jerry and it's you know what is that line where the expectations are high trying to get to the postseason trying to win a division yet you still need to develop young players so that balance is yeah. sometimes can be tricky, but you think about it in last year's context. Think about Cal Raleigh's season. Hmm. You know, struggled to begin the year. And then we saw what he turned into during the course of the season. And part of his injury, he got that opportunity again because Tom Murphy got hurt, but he mm -hmm. took advantage of it. And, but to me, that's an example of why you just can't shut the door on young guys, especially guys that in the scheme of things have not had a lot of time at the major league level because Cal Raleigh now has turned himself into one of the best catchers in baseball at this point. Yeah. I mean, and it's crazy to think about too, right? Cause like he only went to triple a for what? 10 days. Yeah, I know. And then he just came back a, a, just a totally different player. Like, how does that happen? How does it's that wild. happen? You know, we talked to him a couple weeks ago. It's interesting. I, I love talking to, to guys about, you know, situations like that like how how did you do this and you know a lot of times and with him he talked a lot about just 
relaxing more than anything. And, you know, it's the human part of the game that is hard to talk about because, you know, we don't know what's going on in guys' minds. But, Mm -hmm. you know, there is a lot of pressure. And there's a lot happening, especially hitters just coming out now. Pitching is so good. Hitting is so hard. Uh, Harder than ever, I think. And especially for young guys, getting a taste of that for the first time. It is incredibly difficult. Um, So there's just there's a lot at play for young guys. And uh, the fact that Cal did what he did uh, in pretty short order, as you mentioned, the turnaround is so fast. And, man, just to see the season he put together, the home runs, I mean, it's something that none of us could have predicted in April. And he turned out to be such a pillar to what they did and turned in one of the biggest moments in franchise history. And no matter what happens with Cal, the rest of his career, I mean, he'll always have that. Yeah. He'll always have that. And then, I mean, he goes on in the postseason, you know, with a piece of his thumb broken off, catches 18 innings. He hits, you know, one of the biggest home runs in the whole postseason for the Mariners in, in Toronto to kick the scoring off there. Like what he was able to do at the end of the season, given the injury that he was dealing with is, insane is it's truly like remarkable what he was able to do uh, just absolutely unheard of um you know you you've talked about how you you've talked to some of these guys over the course of the off season and you've cut you've conducted a lot of off season interviews over the years at 710 and i'm curious now that the team has ended the drought have you noticed the difference in the messaging than in years past from both the people that have been with the club for some time and those that are just now entering the organization like tay oscar i saw that you guys talked to tay oscar during the the luncheon uh like is there a different feel around this team than you've seen before like has this team truly built a different repu- uh, reputation for itself you know that's a really good question i i would say yes because i think about Let's look at this through Paul Seawald's eyes, just for example. Paul Seawald, who has been with the organization, this will be year three. So he was with the organization the previous two years. All Paul Seawald knows, like he's heard about the drought. Mm -hmm. He's answered plenty of questions about the drought. But all he knows of the Mariners org is a team that's won 90 games in two years. And for a team in year three has expectations to go to the playoffs again and win 90 plus games again and compete for a division title. So it, the drought, I think, has stuck with us who have been around for a long time or have been fans for a long time. But I think when you look at it through the eyes of the team, and a lot of the team is really young, mm-hmm. uh, I, I think their view of themselves and the Mariners is totally different in that regard. I mean, it, it's, and Paul's a great example. Like, all he knows is winning with the Mariners. Right. That's that's what the Mariners are to him. And that, and you go down the list, Gilbert and Kirby and Brash, I mean, check them all off. That's, that's what they know. Obviously. So, I, so yeah, I would say yes, for sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, especially from someone like Tay Oscar, who comes from a great situation in Toronto, mm-hmm. a place where he has a lot of friends and has won a lot of games and to hear him be like, this is where I want to be though. Like that's yeah. that's different, right? You don't hear that from a lot, and obviously he didn't have necessarily a say in coming here. You know, he gets traded for and all that, but to he doesn't necessarily have to say that, right? Like right. you know, obviously these guys, you know, they'll say things for the fans and all that, but like it's it's nice to hear a player of someone of that caliber say, "I can win a World Series here," yeah. Not just like and and you know, it's it's another thing too that we no longer have to hear like, Oh, I want to be the, you know, I want to be a part of the the club that helps, you know, in the drought and all this stuff. We don't have to talk about it anymore. Right. Yeah. It's just about, we're just like every other team now. Like we can yeah. just talk about making the playoffs, winning the division, winning a world series. Like that's, you know, it's just nice to be kind of in that space where you don't have this dark cloud hanging over you the entire time. And this whole like extra goal on top of everything else that teams focus on um you know obviously we're we're still so early on in in julio's career but as a broadcaster i'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this is is it hard to not get a little bit complacent with a star like julio when greatness is just the expectation for him oh that's a great question so i do my best to not take that for granted Mm -hmm. to because i think Uh, We are watching a superstar uh, develop. I think he's in the early stages, but he's got all the tools. He's got everything. He's got absolutely everything 
to be a superstar in this game and a transcendent star beyond baseball. Which is saying, I know that's saying a lot, and that's putting a lot of expectations on it, but I don't take it for granted, or I try not to take it for granted, mm. because it is super fun to watch him every single day. He's the kind of guy, when I think about, if you're driving around in your car and he's batting, like, you're staying in the driveway to hear how that at bat plays out, because he could do something amazing. Mm. I think about every pitch at T-Mobile Park, like the next pitch, he could hit it out of the stadium, legitimately. The next pitch that a pitcher throws, he could rob a home run. I mean, he you mm. never know what he's going to do. And you know, as a kid, I got to grow up and watch Ken Griffey Jr. in that capacity, who transcended baseball and was a superstar in every single way. And I'm so thankful that this new generation of Mariner fans get something similar with what I think will be Julio Rodriguez. They'll get the same thing. He's going to be a Mariner for a long time, and I think he's going to be a great player. I mean, he already had a great year last year in year one. And as we all know, like years aren't linear, development's not linear, but my expectation is that he's going to have another wonderful year. What that looks like, I don't know, but yeah. I'm excited to see what that is. But I'm just, I'm so happy that there is this large group of Mariner fans that are going to grow up with Julio and get to watch Julio and Julio be their guy. Because it's so fun to hear as we went throughout baseball too, to talk to guys like who was your inspiration? Who's your favorite player growing up? And Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. And, you know, fast forward this thing a decade, 20 years from now, I feel like we're going to hear that with Julio. We're going to hear yeah. it from all over. No matter where kids grow up, Julio is going to be their guy. Yeah, I, I really think so because he just I think we talked about this the last time and you uh, you and I um were on here that you know, Julio just he's everything. He's the full package. It's not just that he's a great baseball player, it's that he does everything with a smile and that he's just I mean, like you look at I don't know if you saw the the tops ads that he's been doing, yeah. like where he's like acting and all that. It's just great. He's just such a charismatic dude that he can he can be that superstar. He can be the face that really baseball needs yes. right now baseball really needs a, a guy that they can market the hell out of and really, you know, cause that's Julio's the type of dude that can get young kids interested in baseball. Again, mm -hmm. we, we talked about this last week. We were asked about, you know, how we feel major league baseball should improve in marketing its game and all this. And I think, you know, Julio's really is the, the key to that because, you know, they had, you had an opportunity there with Tatis, but unfortunately Tatis's career has kind of, taken a dive off of the deep end over the last you know year or so so that's not really an option at least at the moment right now so julio's that guy right because mm -hmm. trout doesn't necessarily want it right and i mean you know otani is amazing and does so many amazing things but they haven't really been able to market him at least in america how you know he's been been marketed over in japan i feel like julio's the guy that can be marketed everywhere yeah and, no i agree with you and, and reach all you know all kids around the the globe that might be interested in picking the sport up and it's it's a great thing because you know it's a lot like griffey i know it's really easy and lazy to make those comparisons to griffey but he's very much he carries himself in a very similar way to, to the way that griffey did and you know he's amazing right out of the gate and you know like you said i i, I think that he's even on a, on pace for an even better year because you look at the numbers i mean those numbers are bogged down by an awful april I know. And <laughs> and so, you know, and some of that obviously not his fault. And then he obviously got hurt a couple times as well. And it's like, dude, what is the ceiling for this guy? <laughs> like, I I think about that all the time. Like, that's the question yeah. that you that is the question. What is the ceiling? And I don't have the answer, which is fun. It's really it's fun. Really to fun. That. <laughs> you just look at all the tools. and It's absurd. Yeah. all the different things he can do and the way he runs at his size and, and he's a he's a track star it's it's all ridiculous it's ridiculous it's so ridiculous so uh you you told me before um uh, we hit record on this thing that you're you're heading down to peoria on tuesday um what are, what are some of the storylines you're looking forward to seeing play out this spring obviously you talked a little bit about kelnick but you know mm -hmm. you look at this roster right now and i feel like it pretty much writes itself i don't yeah. expect a lot of position battles it seems like it's pretty much chalk across the board. I mean, there m might be a couple here and there, but barring injury, I think this is this roster is pretty much set. So, you know, for you as someone that's covering the team, has to cover the team every day, 
how are you, uh, you know, what are you looking for? How are you planning on keeping things interesting? Yeah, spring baseball is nuanced to me because, hey, the results don't matter. Like if the Mariners win or lose to the Royals on a Tuesday, it makes no difference, right? You know, standings don't matter. Stats don't matter because there's so many. It was the wind blowing out. Was the wind blowing in? Was a double A pitcher throwing? Did the sun get in the outfielder's eye? There's so many <laughs> variables at spring training that makes all that stuff impossible. But there's plenty of interesting things that happen within the ball game that I think is fun to watch. I think the thing I'll be watching the most is just what the game looks like. First of all, with the rule changes that are going to be implemented in spring training. So what does the pace of the game look like? Uh, what does the shift restriction look like? You know, that sort of thing, just especially, I, I think it's probably going to be, a little rough early on because from what I understand that it's going to be enforced pretty tightly for good reason. They want to get everyone used to it before the regular season. So I'm interested to see what that looks like for me spring. Uh, I always enjoy seeing the young players that I have conversations about. Sometimes I talk to during the course of the season, but I never get to see in person. So like seeing Miller on the mound for the first time and woo uh, get to, Hopefully get to see him at some point. Hancock, you know, the young guys to me, that's the most fun. I think back a couple of years ago when you get to see Julio and Kellick for the first time. It's mm. that sort of thing. Because to me, honestly, for veterans, spring is about getting ready for the season. And whether Julio hits 100 or 700 in spring, it makes no difference to me. I yeah. feel I will not feel any differently about Julio going into the season regardless of the numbers that he puts up for it to me, like health is the number one thing run around, get your mm -hmm. bats, be healthy, get ready for the start of spring when it comes to veterans. And most of the Mariners are a veteran team. Like this is not going to be a spring with a lot of position battles. The other thing I, I do watch and the Mariners have, I think earned this reputation is every time now the Mariners make a waiver claim with a relief pitcher or something like that, it's just every time one of them takes the mound in spring, I I pay extra attention because mm. I, I've learned the lesson from Paul Seawald and go down the list. Like maybe one of these guys is going to be a high leverage guy down the road. I don't know. So I pay extra attention to any random reliever that they picked up during the off season. Yeah, so, we, we do too. We, we were joking with Jerry. It was like, yeah, we had no idea who the hell Justin Topa was, but you know, I, we were like, eh, he'll probably be a top ten pitcher in baseball. <laughs> like, it's I, just, it's just, the, that's just the research. reputation they built. I know. I started my research on Topa specifically because, yeah, you just you don't know what the, you know? with with what they're doing pitching wise, which has been fun, kind of big picture. Um, I feel like the organization is in such a good place. They have so many smart people. Like Jerry and Justin Holler are kind of the face of everything, but mm -hmm. there are so many great Trent Blank and Joe Furman and Jesse Smith, you know, guys that I think the average Mariner fans don't know, but really smart people doing a lot of really great things within the organization. And I think about, you know, it kind of gets lost in just everything that happened last year. But, you know, you think about for the longest time as kind of Felix and Seeger were kind of the homegrown guys forever that made – a big impact in the major league level. And you look up last year and it's, it's Gilbert and it's Kirby and it's Cal and it's Julio and all these guys from in the org popping at the same time. And to me, that's not an accident. They're doing so many smart things with development, which I think is the biggest key in baseball right now. Development of your draft guys, your international guys, guys like Seawald from other orgs. To me, that's it. That's what winning organizations do, whether it's the Dodgers or the Astros or, and hopefully the Mariners are following that same path. So I told you before we were uh, recording that uh, Colby's heading down to Peoria for uh, like a week or so uh, around mid March. And then I'm going down there for like a day or two at the very, very, very end of spring training. So um, I, I want to know what are some uh, some of your favorite spots to eat in Peoria? Any recommendations for stuff to do uh, outside mm. of uh, baseball? Okay, so I will give you my my days down there are just about exactly the same every day. So I'll map okay. it out for you. It's uh, wake up early, go to the complex, do whatever I have to do, talk to whoever I have to talk to, then 
drive to what is usually a day game. Sometimes it's Peoria, sometimes it's somewhere else. Do the game, and then I have a favorite hiking spot next to every ballpark or around mm. near every ballpark in the Cactus League. So that's my thing. The hiking, if you like hiking, if you like the outdoors, Arizona is wonderful. And I can give you a recommendation of a good spot near every ballpark in the Cactus League, whether it's Perfect. Camelback, which is phenomenal, a Pistola Peak, which is great, uh, just a workout spot like Victory Stairs. They're all over the place. So that's my thing down there. That's I'll, uh, I'll definitely that's have to reach out and uh, yeah, ask you about that for sure. Yeah, it, it's great. I mean, because you know the weather's phenomenal. It's usually in the seventies down there, and you just it, it's remarkable that you can feel like you can drive ten minutes from a ballpark and hop on a mountain, and it feels like you're out in the middle of nowhere, which is cool. So, so I've always wondered this. Um, and this is last question. <laughs> I, I, we've already no, no, over time. I, I apologize, but um, how do you keep a broadcast interesting? How do you keep the listener tuned in in the late innings of a spring training game? Like, you know, obviously you have to have some stories to tell, but is that something that you consciously tuck away to save for those moments, or does it just kind of organically happen? So that's a really good question because I think spring training games are the hardest things to call and the most difficult thing we do because you think about a playoff game it's all right there on the platter for you it's all happening every pitch is critical in a playoff game so you're just living in the moment uh spring training is the opposite honestly because as i said before like whether the mariners win or lose this game the mariners record it doesn't matter mm -hmm. In the long term, like when you get to the regular season, like no one, what were the, what was the Mariners spring training record last year? I have no idea. What was the year before? Not a clue. So you're, we're calling games where the wins and losses and the results don't necessarily matter. So going into it, you have to know that's the deal. So what I try and do is I have a lot of conversations during the off season. Now, a lot of them get played uh, during our hot stove shows. Some of them don't, but you know, I try and just consume as much as possible during the off season. And then just whatever scenario is playing out in front of me, kind of go back to it. And maybe Matt Festa is on the Hill and, you know, it's things from, it, it's this, it, the dynamic where, Hey, we can talk about Festa and what he did this off season pitching wise and what he's trying to do now or whether it's festa talking about his trip to italy during the off season right it, the fun stuff so mm. it it's it's finding that so connecting maybe what's happening on the mound but kind of bigger picture where right hey talking about what festa's trying to do right now is he working on a new pitch right now on the mound like the results of that don't really matter in the moment in a spring game but it could have ramifications to the regular season. So that's, that's kind of how I think about it. You're always trying to tie it bigger picture and right. is what happening now. Will that make a difference in the regular season? So is it's tricky. Some, is that something that you dread doing or, or do you kind of revel in it? No, I think it's fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, and spring is pretty loose. Like I'm a guy during the regular season, like, don't miss a pitch. Like the pitch is the thing and you have a rhythm where you're talking, you pause, the pitch is on the way you, you hear the either crack of the bat or the pop of the mitt and you have that rhythm. Spring is a little different. Like I love to have guests on to just talk like some of the people I just Skylar Shibiyama, some of these other people in the org, uh, I like to have them on and just talk things over. And if we miss pitches, we miss pitches. You know, that, it, it's just very loose more than anything right. else. So in that regard, I think spring is, is pretty fun. Uh, just the conversations we have, the things we learn. It's really relaxed. There's, as I said, this, if the Mariners lose that night, win that night, that's not the thing. And like the regular season, that's the thing. Right, the Mariners winning or losing tonight—that's what it's about. Not so much mm -hmm. in the spring. Is it, it's funny. I I don't. It's it's so different spring broadcast than the regular season. So I don't yeah. get a chance to really talk about it very often. So thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. I I really enjoyed this conversation. I always enjoy our conversations. They're they're wonderful. We need to do this a, a lot more often. 
Um, Absolutely. Espe- especially so, you know, I don't let my wife down because <laughs> she, she, she loves this. Uh, she, she loves, well, you'll have uh, to let me know if I lived up to it. So yeah, hopefully it improves. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she, she's tough to impress, but I, I think you, uh, I think we did good here. Uh, <laughs> Gary, thanks for hopping on. Uh, anything uh, you want to tell our listeners here before you head out? Anything you got going on on 710 or uh, the pod? anything no just uh we'll be putting out some more pods during the course of the spring and just i'm excited to get going i'm super excited for the fan base uh fan i love the mariners fan base i you know i grew up here so i feel like you know i'm i'm have a connection to the fan base here but you know it's such a passionate group and even when you know you're on one side of an argument than the other it's it all comes from the same place it all comes from passion and loving the team and wanting the team to do well that sort of thing which i love so i'm just excited to get things going again and i'm excited to see the fans down in spring and especially first pitch during the regular season so i'm pumped can't wait to start Thank you again to Gary for hopping on with us. Wonderful conversation. Hope you really enjoyed it. That's going to do it for our show. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. I've been your host, Tidy Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Dane Gonzalez. It's D-A-N-E-G-N-Z-L-Z. And my co-host, Colby, at CPAT11. That's C-P-A-T-1-1. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. And thank you again for making us your first listen. Now make your second listen, Locked On MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts just like us. And with that, have yourself a beautiful baseball day and we'll see you tomorrow. Peace.